Hello everyone and welcome back to Creation Myths. I have a fun one this time. It's kind of a lighter one. This is a clip from an open mic on the Standing for Truth channel. It's actually the same appearance from September of 2023 that I've shown segments from in a couple of other videos. Unlike the other two videos in which I featured clips from this show, there isn't like a broader point I'm trying to make here. This is just a short segment of that conversation in which Donnie, standing for truth, the host of the channel, brings up lactase persistence. He's trying to tee up a non-evolutionary explanation for what we all agree is a novel beneficial trait. But as you'll see, the most common reasons for lactase persistence are well understood. So unlike what happens some of the time with guests who aren't professionals in this field, he can't just push me around here. To provide a little bit of background, as mammals, most of us are capable of digesting lactose, the sugar in milk, when we're very young, right? Because we're mammals. This is how infants survive. They drink milk. Lactase is the enzyme that allows us to do this, right? So lactose is the sugar that we find specifically in milk. Lactase is the enzyme that breaks down that sugar. Now, most humans experience some decrease in the level of expression of that gene as you get older. So while we can digest lactose as young children, by adulthood, most of us do so at a reduced level or in many cases, not at all. But many people have a trait called lactase persistence. They continue to express lactase at high levels throughout life, meaning they can continue to consume and digest dairy products throughout adulthood. The main reason for this is one of two, just two very specific single base mutations that occurred in the early, you know, earlier history of humans sometime around the origins of agriculture, which happened in a bunch of different places approximately simultaneously. So shortly after that happened, these different mutations occurred, and there's two main ones uh, that occurred in a nearby region of the genome called an enhancer. Enhancers are regulatory elements that increase gene expression when active. Activity of this particular enhancer usually drops off as you get older, from early childhood into your teenage years. But there are two fairly common mutations, and then two or three less common ones in the exact same region of the genome that keep the expression level of this gene high at, like, the infant level into adulthood. Now, I've covered this before, so if you want, like, the details of the genetics of what's going on here, that link is going to be down below. You can check that out. Now, naturally, creationists don't like this explanation because many creationists argue that beneficial mutations are either virtually impossible or so rare that they can't possibly have an effect on long-term evolution. So they throw all kinds of other ideas at the wall in an attempt to explain away this extremely clear-cut and well-understood case of beneficial mutations. The point here, with this video that I'm showing you today, other than having fun, because, you know, it's fun when amateur creationists make bad arguments and then get smacked down, we can all enjoy that. But the point is for you, my primary audience, my non-scientist audience, because most people are not scientists, never mind evolutionary biologists, my point is for you to hear the creationist argument designed to negate lactase persistence as an actual beneficial mutation, and also the counter-arguments. So if you ever encounter a creationist claiming, well, actually, lactase persistence doesn't count in the wild, you're able to explain briefly and clearly why that's wrong. So with all that out of the way, here's the clip. Enjoy. So I'd be curious. But on this topic of beneficial mutations and what is the ratio of those which are reductive or maybe just epigenetic related and those that are uh, based on true novelty and adaptation without any reductive effects, if we can say it that way. When it comes to lactose tolerance, I know Dan's done a lot of study on this. I know Matt is, as well. My current understanding of it is that some people have a mutation in the MCM6 gene, which basically regu regulates the lactase gene. But that gene is hit with a mutation, and now the lactase gene is basically never shut off. 
And so this mutation in keeping the MCM6 from shutting down the lactase gene means people with this mutation can now digest lactose, basically. And so, yeah, it's a benefit, but it's reductive. Um, I'd wonder what your thoughts are on that, Dr. Dan. And Matt, you've done a lot of study on this too, and maybe go over your understanding. We'll start with you, Dan. Go ahead. Yeah. So the, there's a bunch of different, um, so lactase persistence, the ability to digest lactose throughout your life has evolved multiple times in humans. There are two main mutations that explain most of that trait in humans, but there's a bunch of other ones that are present at much lower frequencies, but the two big ones, uh, both do the same thing. And I want to note as I do this, uh, Grayson's been waiting a while. He should totally go next at some like soon. Um, uh, but so they are, MCM6 is a helicase. It's not uh, a regulator of any kind. It's a, it's a helicase that, that uh, opens up the DNA. Um, but within an intron of the MCM6 gene, there is an enhancer for the adjacent lactase gene. And uh, the two most common genotypes for lactase persistence in humans, that um, the, pr the, the uh, promoter for that uh, lactase gene is very low affinity. So when you are a baby and the only metabolic genes you have going on are for milk, then that gets all the transcription factors and you express lactose. But as you go through your childhood and all your other digestive pathways come online as you diversify your diet, that promoter for lactase loses out to the higher affinity promoters in your genome. When there's a mutation in that enhancer, that increases the affinity of that promoter for the transcription factors. So you maintain higher expression levels throughout your life. It doesn't break the regulation of any other gene. It doesn't mess with MCM6 because it's in an enhancer uh, within an intron. It's not messing with its amino acid sequence. So that's a, that's a beneficial mutation that doesn't have a downstream cost. Uh, and it's, there's a lot of incorrect stuff. I know, um, uh, I saw a presentation by Dr. Kevin Anderson a few years ago before he passed, uh, where he incorrectly called the MCM6 gene uh, a repressor of lactase. That's not true. It's a, it's a helicase that does different stuff, but there's the enhancer within an intron that explains, I forget the exact percentage, so I don't want to put a specific number on it, but I'll just say most getting towards almost all lactase persistence is explained by these two main mutations that we see in that enhancer that increase its affinity that allow you to maintain high expression throughout adulthood. Okay. Appreciate that. Matt, okay, go any next? thoughts on that? Yeah, well, we're going to throw it to Matt first and then we'll, because we'll, Grayson, I think you want to go back to the uh, hierarchy. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And we want to stick on lactose. We can go to Matt. Yeah. Matt, go ahead. Give your thoughts on that. And then we'll jump into, or we'll shift back into the unconstrained, uh, topic, unless Dan wants to respond to anything you say, go ahead, Matt. Do you believe uh, the the lactose tolerance is is a good example of a beneficial mutation without any reductive effects, Matt? You're Matt. You're on mute. Thanks. I think it's more epigenetically regulated than almost anything because why would it why would it stay on in some people and not in others? I say, I think that it's more like um, clicking on really quickly in regions of the world where people's abundance of food is very limited, and so there isn't much for them to consume. And then all that and and it's almost like the body knows that it's like well, there's only blood and milk when you consume it in this region of the world, right? So it's staying on. So if you share my screen, you can see that the, as we get older, even people that have the ability to digest lactose lose it as we get older. So it's a, we're seeing that even if it was just a mutation and it clicked on at all times, then there would, uh, why would it get weaker over time? It would, it seems to me that if it would be epigenetically regulated, it explains it the best because the gene starts to not require it as, or it starts losing that function later in life. So um, if you're requiring to drink milk uh, based on your caloric need, and then that, that function starts to diminish the older we get, then that's a life and death type of situation. If it was a mutation and it permanently stayed on, and then it, then we could point to that mutation and say, that's a guaranteed, it's just a mutation to always be on and they'll always have the ability to digest lactose. But that doesn't seem to be the case. Okay, appreciate it, Matt. Dan, before we move back to the, to, to be fair, did you have any thoughts on that? 
Uh, yeah, it's so it it's very much uh, mutations in the enhancer. It's not epigenetic uh, for the vast majority of people who have lactose persistence. It's um, there's a paper uh, from 2008, uh, Enita et al. I'll put the I'll put the name in the chat. Um, here, I'll just put this in the chat for you uh, in the on YouTube. Um, that's the that paper goes into it, uh, documenting the specific mutations. You're going to see drop offs over time because like gene regulation is leaky and there's lots of factors that go into it, but it's not epigenetic. We've directly documented the specific mutations within that enhancer that um, lead to uh, lactase persistence. And it's uh, in this paper, they specifically talk about four mutations within a nine base pair range in the genome that uh, that do it. Um, so it's it's not epigenetic. It's specific single base point mutations. We've documented them. It's in the enhancer within the MCM6 gene. Uh, yeah. So Dan, you wouldn't characterize it as basically a loss of the ability to turn off lactose production following it, weaning? No. Right. Correct. It's not a loss of the ability to turn it off because it's so what an enhancer does is it increases the affinity of the promoter. The promoter says, start expressing your gene here. And uh, the enhancer increases the affinity of that promoter for the proteins that express your gene. There's other mechanisms that are unconnected from that that turn the gene off. So it's a gas pedal and a brake pedal, two separate things, right? So this floors the gas pedal and it keeps it at a high level. But the brake pedal is an independent thing. And in gene regulation, the brake pedal supersedes the gas pedal. It operates downstream. So you, you hit that brake pedal and it still shuts it down. But when the brake pedal is off, you have the ability to express the gene at a higher level than you otherwise would. Now, it it being always expressed or regulated, you, you, you... that's not okay. what it is. Though it's not always expressed. That's the point. It's that you your maximum level of expression is higher than it would otherwise be, but you can still turn it off when you're not using it. So you're saying you're digesting lactose, but you still have the ability to turn it off, even mm -hmm. though you're. So it's not stuck on. Yes, correct. So in, in, in the same way that if I'm driving a car and I'm flooring the gas pedal, I can let my foot off a little bit and kind of slow down, speed up, slow down. You can still, a better analogy is you can still hit the brake. You can still hit the brake. So and you're hitting the brake at the same genetics, time. As... the brake overrides the gas. Okay. Typically with gene expression. Okay, typically, a... typically the inhibitors operate downstream. So you can have a high affinity promoter and start transcription, but typically there's something downstream that can interrupt that. So even if you have a super high affinity promoter, you're still able to interrupt that downstream. I'm not sure how this is evidence for constructive mutations. We're just trying to, because earlier I said the question is, on this? is this, is, is this trade-off that we see, is it sustainable? So we can examine each well, example of a I'm beneficial. Gonna let go. I'm going to call it good on this. So you get the last word and then I'm going to not do this. So Grayson can talk. Okay. Um, with that being said, then Matt, let's give you the last word on this one. Then we'll let Grayson talk and wherever Grayson wants to take us, we'll go. Matt, what are your thoughts on um, Dan's counter arguments to your epigenetic argument? And you are on mute, Matt. Just make sure to unmute. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Um, no, I just find it as a very strange um, uh, thing that's going on in the body that's, uh, you know, turning on and off, um, being regulated by, by um, you know, our, our surroundings. Um, if it was, um, if this was a uh, clearly a beneficial mutation that would be spreading through the population, it would be reaching fixation a long time ago. Um, like, like, like a lot of ben extremely beneficial mutations. I mean, what detriment is there for drinking milk throughout your life? Pretty much none that I can imagine. So um, being able to stop doing it, you've just lost an entire food group, dairy. <laughs> and a lot of people have that unfortunate uh, thing. You know, people can't eat cheese, dairy, pizza, anything. So um, I, have, I linked uh, an epigenetic paper just for everyone to see that they can go through themselves and look at it themselves. That's all. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Great discussion. Grayson, over to you. Yeah, so it's an example of a beneficial constructive mutation because if an organism has it, that mutation increases the functionality in a way that is uh, the functionality of this biochemical network in a way that is beneficial to its ability to propagate its genome in its current environment. All right. So there's a like when he said that 
if it's beneficial or, or harmful only rely, relays to the individual. No, it relates to the individual in its current environment, right? So if the environment changes, what it means to be like beneficial also changes. I mean, that should be make intuitive sense to everyone. It's a very simple concept to understand. And if you don't like that example, we can always go with another example. My, one of my favorite examples of a beneficial or if, you know, Darth wants to call them constructive mutations, we can go with that is nylonase, which is like an entirely new family of proteins. So that was my short conversation with Donnie and Ramat on the causes for lactase persistence. Like I said at the top, I'm not making a broader point here uh, about how creations argue this or that. I'm just showing a short conversation with two amateur YouTube creationists trying to discredit lactase persistence as an example of the evolution of a novel beneficial trait and failing. My hope is that in showing this one specific creationist argument and the response, I'm preparing my audience to address it if you ever encounter it. Before I go, I want to thank my two super supporters, Ian Chen Official and Charles Payette. If you become a channel supporter at any level, you get immediate access to my pre-recorded videos, which become public usually on Wednesday nights on weeks I don't do a live show. If I'm doing a live show, we haven't quite figured out the space-time shenanigans to make that available early, but I promise, if we ever do, you'll get early access to those too, as a channel member. Thank you for watching. Please like this video, leave a comment, share it, and if you're not already subscribed to the channel, please subscribe. This video has hopefully showed you how to respond to creationist nonsense around lactase persistence. Thank you again for watching, and don't get fooled.